Uh, well, welcome everybody. There's still a few cookies over here to eat. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, the, introduce um, Dr. Yorgo Fanecos, um, who's originally from Greece. He uh, graduated from the Silvio, uh, the National University Tech Technical University of Athens, and got his PhD at um, University of Pennsylvania. He was on the faculty at Arizona State for a while, and he recently moved to Toyota Technical Center here. And that's about all I learned from the 30 seconds I spent looking at his bio. So I will let him tell you more about himself. The invitation, I'm glad to be here, uh, talking about control barrier functions, especially since uh, Control barrier functions, in a sense, started from, from here, uh, among uh, other places. Um, so a, a quick disclaimer, even though I'm now at Toyota Motor North America, uh, the work I present here is not necessarily a product of that employment. It's primarily from uh, my uh, work at Arizona State University. But I was working with Toyota Research during that time, so a lot of the uh, work I'm going to present here is actually in collaboration with Toyota Research. All right, um, so what I'm going to talk about is, um, first of all, how do we navigate automated driving systems in crowded environments? And I started thinking about this uh, question uh, a few years back uh, in the following sense. Uh, the Whenever we navigate in uh, crowded environments, and here by crowded environments, I mean with, with many cars, robots, humans, human-driven cars, and so on, we are going to run into situations where, okay, my mouse is not working anymore, where, for example, we have to merge in very crowded spaces where the vehicles are moving fast. So typically here, we cannot ignore uh, how uh, the, the risk involved in uh, joining, let's say, if, if you are merging on the highway, right? So there is a, a risk involved here. Also, if we have a robot, a mobile robot navigating, let's say a service robot navigating in a station, maybe carrying some suitcase and so on. So there's always the possibility for um, taking risky movements, right? And... Um, how I started thinking about it is looking at this, uh, these videos online where you have, you make your predictions, everything seems to be moving smoothly, and all of a sudden you have uh, cars flying in front of you, right? So it's very hard to make models and predict uh, what's going to happen. Give me a second. For some reason, my pointer is now all over the place. for that. Doesn't want to collaborate. Okay. All right. Now it's working. So I want to, to think about the risk. And uh, as I said before, absolute safety. Uh -huh. Absolute safety might not be possible to guarantee. So, for example, if you have a vehicle that would like to move to this position on the highway, you have another another number of agents, and we want to be absolutely safe. We all right. We may okay. I have to stop this. Apologies. All right. So. If we consider the reachable spaces for the movement of these vehicles, it might uh, we may be able to guarantee safety, meaning that the vehicle is not going to collide with other vehicles, but potentially we may miss our target here, right? So we may not be able to visit this position. So even though we guarantee safety, we may not be able to guarantee liveness here. Um, similarly, for mobile robots navigating among humans, we may run into the same scenario. Should the robot move cut in front of the human? Should we wait uh, for one human to go through? Or uh, all of them? So it's a question on how you would like to plan moving in that environment. So you potentially you have to take a risk there. Um, so how do we formalize the risk in motion planning? And 
uh, that's all among the questions I'm going to discuss today in the lecture. And another topic that is coincidental but also of importance is how do we, how can we add communication? And here I, I don't mean robot to robot communication, but human to robot or human to automated driving system communication in order to improve liveness so that the system overall can reach its goals. So in this particular case, liveness is the CS term, computer science term for reaching your goal. And uh, communication, again, I mean with humans. So in this particular case, the robot might want to say, okay, I'm going to turn left. Uh, please let me go through, right? And we need to plan for that action and uh, take into consideration the results of the, the human motion. All right, so what I'm going to present today is uh, risk-bounded motion planning. I would like to incorporate risk in our motion planning decisions. And I'm going to present two, two different results, one on uh, with known obstacle dynamics and one with unknown obstacle dynamics. Then uh, I'm going to discuss about some neural network stuff about uh, motion planning and CBF, uh, just because uh, neural networks are popular these days. And also in the, uh, between, I'm going to discuss about human communication aware planning, which is very recent results. Um, yeah. All right, risk-bounded motion planning. This is work primarily done in collaboration with Toyota. And uh, the main person uh, driving this research is uh, uh, Sakiba Yakubi. Uh, she was a PhD student at Arizona State University. Now she's at Motional. And I'm going to go over, uh, over these results. Uh, so what is the basic problem definition here? We consider the ego vehicle, which is the vehicle under control that we would like to uh, control, uh, to be an affine control system. So this is the standard form of affine control systems. I don't have any stochasticity here. And I would like to compute the control actions for that vehicle steering and uh, velocity commands so it can reach its goal while being safe, but probabilistically safe. We have another uh, number of agents in the environment. These are now modeled as stochastic differential equations. Um, and here we introduce that noise because we cannot always predict fully the action of these um, agents. And we consider them to be unsafe sets in the environment. So um, we have moreover a goal where the ego vehicle should reach eventually that goal. And so that should happen by bounding the risk of collisions. And uh, yes, by bounding the risk of collision. So formally the problem is as follows, uh, given a finite horizon, T, because we would like to reach the, the goal within a finite horizon, a goal set and a desired upper bound P bar on the probability to enter the unsafe set, we'll have to compute the control action uh, U such that this here holds, meaning um, at any point in time, we should always uh, be in the safe set. Okay, so here I'm missing. Uh, I shouldn't be in this uh, uh, unsafe set. I should be in the safe set. All right, that's that's the problem. And moreover, that upper bound on the probability should be tunable. Uh, as designers, we should choose some cases where we would like the system to be very safe. Sometimes the system should take big risks. The same applies to uh, mobile robot navigation in uh, crowded environments. Doesn't the, the what I'm discussing about? It's not only applicable to highway driving. All right. So our solution is motivated by control barrier functions, and control barrier functions started or were conceived in a sense back in 2014. Professor Grizzle here was among the initial founders for that, so uh, that's something to be uh, highlighted here. And I'm going to just go briefly over that. I kind of assume, given how many people work on control very functions here, that this is potentially known. But just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, I'm going to mention over a very, very brief, brief overview of the results on control barrier function. So we assume that we have a control system which is in a fine uh, form, uh, control a fine dynamical system. This is a fine because you here appears in a fine uh, equation. So X can be in a nonlinear um, uh, equation or expression, 
but you, if you notice here, it is in an affine form. We consider a safe set, C, and we would like to design a control so that for all initial conditions and for all time, the system state remains inside the safe set. Okay, so this is the basic setup. And of course, if the system stays, if the trajectory stays within the safe set, then we could say that the system is safe. Moreover, this set C is forward invariant uh, because we always propagate it towards the future and remains in a safe invariant. And you can view, visualize this. Uh, one of my uh, former students made a very nice animation that I have to show it. So you see here, uh, we assume that this is the safe uh, set and therefore the system operates within that set moving forward in the future. Is the left side the, the, end, the end effector of the pendulum? Uh, yes. So here the two angles are the two angles of the pendulum. Oh, okay. Yes. So that I wanted to do. I don't remember which one is which, but uh, yeah, that's the idea. So if we consider the safe set to be defined using a function h where it says wherever h is greater than zero then the system is safe then we can potentially visualize this over the state of the system as some positive function where we would like to remain within um, and in order to find, uh, in order to, uh, yeah. so um, in order to have that the safe set is forward invariant, we'll have to satisfy here this differential equation. Now, here this. This is a function, this is not a constant. This is a function where we uh, apply uh, two h of x. And this function a alpha of x has to be strictly increasing and moreover at zero has to have the value zero. So the idea here is that when we approach the boundary of the safe set and therefore the function h becomes zero, then the derivative of h uh, at that point becomes greater or equal than zero and therefore we are pushed back inside the safe set c so that's kind of the intuition behind the the control uh, barrier function here and if a, h is a control barrier function if the class k function alpha can be found such that the following is satisfied so here we have the uh, lead derivatives um, so if we go back to the equation here So notice that X here is uh, given to us by the system dynamics, right? If I go back, we have this affine control system defining the system dynamics. So in order to compute here the derivative of H, we have also X, which is a function of time T. And therefore we'll have to take here the lead derivatives of first uh, uh, with respect to F here and then with G. Uh, in order to derive this equation here, expand it. And of course, there are some challenges here. What if this term is zero and uh, the input u disappears entirely from the equation? Or if it has a greater relative degree, um, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. So now, any Lipschitz continuous controller that is within this, that satisfies this equation up here makes C a forward invariant set for the system sigma. Okay, so this is the original results, well known, and uh, by now, well known by now. And what we would like to do is now extend this in order to be able to reason about the risk in the system. Um, if you have not seen uh, control design and control barrier functions, here I have some example. This is a very simple system, and we would like to stay close to some given trajectory and we would like to compute inputs so that we stay close to the trajectory subject to this um, constraint for the control barrier function so we can have now static obstacles and we can just move around them or we can even have dynamic obstacles 
and we can still uh, avoid uh, the obstacles by solving this uh, program uh, quadratic program on on the on the fly. All right. So, what about stochastic systems? When we consider stochastic systems, there was a lot of work trying to create parallels to Lyapunov functions or barrier functions to the stochastic domain. Now, reviewing that literature, the assumption that they were making was that the probability to enter the unsafe set would be zero for your bounded time. Okay? So this necessarily means uh, that any any control actions that you would be computing are going to be extremely conservative because if you're going to guarantee that the probability of uh, getting into a bad situation is zero then necessarily you have to be conservative potentially as conservative as kind of taking uh, worst case scenarios um, yes in the in the original system so a remark for those who pay attention to notation, uh, you might see that I have here the X tilde, and this refers to the stopped process, because now we are talking about stochastic processes for stochastic systems. We talk about risk. We are going to have, of course, a random uh, variable describing the evolution of the system, and therefore we have to reason about the stop process. So any slides you see from now on, you're going to see the tilde over that, and uh, so that kind of answers that question. This is the stop process. Okay, so what is the problem here? Uh, previously, as we said, most of the work was considering zero probability for uh, collision. And in this work, we wanted to relax that. We would like to say that the probability for getting into a bad situation is upper bounded by some given probability. So our goal here is to confine uh, an input U such that the robot in this particular case reaches the goal set and that every time the probability of uh, collision is upper bounded by that uh, P bar. So we'll start from here. The equivalent of lead derivatives in the stochastic world is the infinitesimal generators that effectively characterize the temporal evolution of a function B of a stochastic variable X0. So you can see here, we take the limit uh, of T towards to zero, expectation of the function B of that uh, variable at time T, assuming that we start at some initial condition, minus the value of B at that initial condition, divided by t okay so this is the the limit this is the definition and it was shown a long time ago by Oxendal um, actually you can view see this result in, in this book by Oxendal that this here is actually equal to this equation here which is very similar to the uh, equation about lead derivatives that we had for the deterministic case of control barrier functions. So what you notice here is um, we take the derivative of B with respect to X0, we have the dynamics, and uh, here we have this component that effectively is like a, a variance in the sense that trace uh, here, uh, yes, so we compute the trace here. And we have this result because again, we have stochastic differential equations. Now, the idea here is to design a barrier function that is now going to bound the probabilities based on the definition of the unsafe set that we have. Remember, we have these unsafe sets over the vehicles. We want to take that uh, uh, definition of unsafe set and translate this somehow into a bound for these um, stochastic barrier functions. So the barrier function has to be twice differentiable. This is a condition in order to be able to derive these results. It has to be everywhere uh, positive, this function B. And moreover, when we are in the unsafe set, this has to be greater or equal to one. 
So if we consider, for example, the, um, the unsafe set to be described by a circle, the, um, the barrier function that we'll consider could be, for instance, this exponential of minus uh, uh, h x of this uh, unsafe set. Okay. So that's how it will look like. That's a good question. Sure. Like in the normal barrier function literature, like the way you initially described it, like the barrier at zero is describing the boundary between safe and unsafe. And now there's like some offset here. Is that like material here that the fact that the boundary is b is equal to one? B equal, uh, equals to one because we want to talk about probabilities. And so you couldn't work out the math with just like B equal to zero as the boundary between safe and unsafe. And if I go negative, then I'm unsafe and I compute that probability. Um, or is it just a notational thing, I guess is my question. That's uh, something we didn't think. And <laughs> the reason that, uh, yeah. Uh, there is a, this is called the reciprocal period function. This is a, another form of a, of a variant function, not the zero in one, but falls under the reciprocal one. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. The among the reasons is that we are basing um, on um, uh, existing literature on stochastic uh, uh, differential equations, and so we want to take that route here. It's not we didn't innovate here, so we didn't really think about this uh, question, to be honest. Um, question online. Um, yes. Could, could could you go back? Um, you. you you say bx should be greater than one. So bx here is a barrier certificate, not instead of a barrier function, right? Yes, in this case, yes, it is. We okay, haven't okay. talked about uh, control yet. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. All right, so we define here the following probability as the supremum over the time interval we would like to consider. And we would like this uh, function B uh, at that point in time to be greater or equal than one. And we'll um, notice that the probability here of being unsafe is upper bounded by this uh, probability because we take the supremum here of the barrier uh, function. And we need to find now an upper bound actually on this probability here. So here is the, the theorem. We, if there exists A and B greater or equal than zero, such that this here holds, we have the infinitesimal generator uh, minus here this uh, parameter A times the uh, barrier function plus B. Then at every time t, uh, the state uh, and, and state x of, of t for the stopping time process, we are going to have the following. I don't know if I want to read all these conditions, but you see here we have something that uh, is for a equals zero. We have if a is greater than zero and b is less than or equal to, uh, to alpha. If alpha is greater than zero and alpha is less than uh, b here, we have different uh, ways to, to bound the probability pu being unsafe, okay? Now, these here are actually, uh, the, the proof comes from standard uh, theory in stochastic differential equations. So if you read the uh, uh, technical report by Kastner on sto uh, stochastic stability and control, these results are immediate from, from that uh, literature. Now, what is missing in this picture is the fact that we would like to have a designed upper bound that we can control the uh, control, uh, control design process. So on top of that, we would like to, to add the following constraint. We would like to say that these upper bounds that come from standard theory are now upper bounded by our design uh, upper bounding probability that somebody gives us, right? Remember that somebody says, you have to satisfy this risk. And now we upper bound the upper bound we got uh, before. And therefore now we have a way to start designing these uh, parameters A and B so that we satisfy these upper bounds. Okay, so that's the idea here. So now we can design these stochastic control barrier functions. 
uh, up to this point, we're just discussing about barrier functions. Now we can start bringing back the control. So we can uh, have the infinitesimal generator for this uh, random process X. This is what you get if you do the uh, computations. And of course, we want to have this upper bounded by this quantity we described before. So now we have choices on how we can pick our A and B so that we satisfy that given upper bound P. And you see here that for all these design choices, the upper bound on the probability appears somewhere in the equation, giving us concrete ways to compute this A and B. Now, moreover here though, uh, we would like to potentially fix A or B and compute the other one because Otherwise, we don't get linear constraints to have in our quadratic program for computing the optimal control function, okay? So this is the effectively the essence here, uh, the whole meat of moving into a stochastic uh, risk-based uh, control barrier function framework. And what else do I have here? Okay, so how do we formulate now? How do we compute the control action U that satisfies this risk uh, bounds? Uh, we, we formulate... Uh, a quadratic program control. So we have to pick, uh, we, we optimize over U and potentially the parameters A and B in case we would like to, to optimize, um, potentially relax some of the constraints, but still while satisfying the upper probability P. We have our constraints to bound the risk here. So we, this is the uh, infinitesimal generator upper bound. Here we have the different conditions for the relation between A and B. And down here, we have the constraint for reaching the goal. Notice that this is the standard formulation because the ego vehicle, we didn't consider any noise on that. So it's a standard differential equation, uh, a deterministic affine control uh, system. So therefore we don't need to have their stochastics in the, um, in the formulation as a constraint. All right, um, what else I would like to say here? Okay, yes, this, this comment here is that notice that these constraints are not linear. So if you want to linearize them, we'll have to fix A or B and compute the other one based on these uh, equations here. Sorry. Yes. Could you remind me what is U sub B? U sub D. Okay, so this is a reference um, controller here. Uh, I think I didn't discuss about this, but you, you can assume that there is a reference controller that you would like to track or a reference trajectory uh, for reaching your goal, for example. You can think of this as also an add-on that tries, if you have a reference trajectory that you would like to follow, you would like to compute the safe control actions that get you to your goal while avoiding all the other uh, unsafe agents. All right, so here's the example. Uh, we have uh, a bicycle type of model where we control velocity and steering. And the goal is to reach the fourth lane. So here's the animation. This is the ego vehicle. And these are all uh, other agents that are um, in the environment and we'd like the vehicle to reach this green um, lane between these, these uh, two green lines. So here's how it looks like. Okay, successfully it's there. I, um, what you might notice here is the maximum bound on the probability that uh, we compute. And you can see that is always bounded by 0 0.1. Potentially it's a little bit high bound to say that uh, the system is safe. Effectively it says you have 10% chance of getting into an accident, but uh, we want to make some uh, demonstration here. So here it is. Um, this U2 is the angular velocity, how fast you turn your wheel. Uh, you can see around four seconds, the vehicle turned a little bit abruptly. Uh, so where is the, the time? So time here is 2.6. Uh, yeah, around here, effectively, because it went back to its lane, right? It was, it was speeding 
towards that uh, uh, vehicle up here and then turns and goes back to its lane. Okay. Uh, sorry, question on that. Yeah. Um, because from the intuition, uh, if the trajectory is uh, infinite, infinite, the safety guarantee probability tend to be zero. Could we really get the a non-zero safety guarantee? These results are all for bounded time. Does this okay, answer your question? Time. Yes. Okay, okay. All the Got results it. assume that we have bounded time. It doesn't make sense for this setup to talk about infinite uh, time. So you can see here we we always consider some upper bound, uh, some bounded upper time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and you can run also experiments on robots. This is a fun video. Uh, it's a little bit slow in the beginning. Let me move it a little bit. Oh no, it's not playing. Come on. Oh, don't crash. Oh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> All right, this is the, the problem of not giving uh, any more often frequently talks. So the equipment is not cooperating with me. All right, my lectures disappeared. All right, it's playing. So the interesting part here is that you'll notice that the robot backs. So it approaches a lot of the, the humans, but it moves backward. And the beauty of this is that uh, it was all computed through the optimal control there. No, nothing like oh, if an else case where you say, okay, if you get too close to the human, then you have to back up, right? That, that's kind of a very nice... Uh, side effect of utilizing this as a uh, as a control optimization here problem all right um we also extended this work with kalman filters where you don't know the full state of all these other agents that are in the environment but you assume that you have a kalman filter estimating the uh some of the states of these other agents and Within this type of stochastic differential equations, including a Kalman filter is kind of uh, trivial because it falls within the same family of results for uh, bounding probabilities. And now, if I play the video, I'm not going to show any equations here, but if I play the video, you will see here the, these circles are kind of the estimates of where the vehicle actually is. Can you see them? Or they're kind of yes. yellow, yes. but... Uh, and we are hi highlighting the ones that are uh, closer to the vehicle, kind of highlighting which are the important vehicles in making these uh, control computations. All right. Just want to highlight that we can do Kalman filters, yes. So your risk bound is taking into account the estimated Kalman filter es um, estimation error? Yes, absolutely, because there are results that say how to bound the probability of how far away you could be from where you really are. There are some interesting results. So if you, if you check this paper, you'll find the references that we used. Yes. Uh, how far can we push this control framework? For example, like higher velocity and like higher, like the omega for the other agents. How far can you test this? All right, this is a good question. Um, I should remind, at this point, which is a good point to remind that, that for this type of problems, we have a model of the other agents. So there is a model, and the stochasticity comes here for no, some noise that might be in the system in the behavior of these other agents. So if you ask me how much we can push it, if you have the, the model, for that process, it's there. You don't have to do anything else, right? Uh, but this is a good question uh, because it brings me to the second part of this lecture where we don't make any assumptions on the dynamics 
of the other agents. Uh, so this is a, a separate work where we don't assume that the other agents are modeled using stochastic differential equations, but that rather we use some uh, probability distribution of where the agents are now and where they can be in the future. Uh, so the framework now uh, is utilizing uh, rapidly exploring random trees as a reference trajectories for the uh, for, for the reference to, to follow using uh, control barrier functions. So this is the, the overview. We have a robot motion model. This is for the robot itself to estimate its own motion. We have a motion prediction component. In this particular case, we assume that we have, uh, we utilize an algorithm that, uh, that is based on Markov decision processes, and it gives you a distribution of where the human might be given the current position and potentially uh, movement of the human. Um, and then we take this prediction and we assume that we would like these predictions to be within a certain level set of uh, probability. And we use now that as a deterministic chance constraint for classical control barrier functions. And this loop continues. So effectively, um, again, we assume that we have a distribution at every point in time or where the human might be. We bound that to the desired level of risk that we are willing to tolerate. So now you have a, an obstacle that you would like to avoid. And you can explore the search space by doing rapidly exploring random trees. And I'm not going to uh, explain this now, but you can assume for those who don't know, you, uh, for every point in time, you check different control inputs and you reiterate uh, for a bounded duration of time. The only difference here is that as we grow the tree, we always check if we are safe based on the chance constraints that we have for the human motion. Okay, so that's the only difference. We don't just explore the, um, the, the free workspace, but also we take into account the safety constraints from the control barrier functions. Okay, and here is the, the videos that you might observe. On the left side, you see, I think it's either MATLAB or Python simulation where you see the tree growing. And on the right, you see what the robot actually sees. For some reason, it's extremely pixeled. Uh, this should have been better, okay. The next video is a little bit more interesting. There is some more interaction with uh, humans. So in this particular scenario, the robot is going to make a right. There are multiple humans, some static, uh, where if you don't have a way to predict that these humans are actually static, then they have some small motions and you have an estimation of where they might be at the next point in time and makes the problem a little bit more interesting. But of course, in this case, the safety guarantees are as good as your prediction model for where the humans might be over time. So the robot goes and avoids completely the, the humans and then also avoiding the other human. And we didn't stop when the humans were approaching us. So that's, that's the, the, the point of having risk-based control here. All right. Uh, any questions? Okay. okay, now let me discuss uh, briefly another line of work that I'm extremely excited about. And this has to do with communication aware motion planning. And I, I make this transition here because actually we are going to be using this um, RRT planner as a component for communication aware motion planning. Uh, this was published in ICRA this year, actually. Okay, so what is the idea? When you have robots operating in big spaces 
uh, then you can just avoid the humans. You don't really care, or potentially, based on research on human-robot interaction, the robot might create an implicit communication to the human, for example, moving a little bit left and then moving to the right to indicate to the human that you're actually going to move to the right and enter the corridor. But when you are in a, a closer, more confined spaces, the same is not possible, right? So you have a corridor uh, that is too narrow to give to the human implicit signals of communication of what you're planning to do. And you can think that these type of scenarios are very prominent in hospital environments you may, where you may have a small room with a bed and the robot has to move around the bed and things like that. So these things are becoming more uh, important. So the idea here is how do we plan when the robot should give some communication instruction to, to the human so that the human can receive it, react, and improve the planning process here. That's the idea. Uh, we came up with this framework after many, many iterations. Uh, so what you see here are the following components. We have a motion planner that is based on the CBF RRT that I described before. We utilize here CBF since, of course, there is some uncertainty on where the humans might be. And if we want to uh, account for the risk involved in uh, these pro uh, processes, we'll have to consider that uh, as uh, a component in our system. Now, notice that, of course, we have the human model, motion model. And this human motion model is also inputted to this upper uh, component, which is the communication planner. This communication planner takes the paths computed by the robot, the human movement model, and in addition, it takes what we call human sensor model. By that, we have left it abstract in the planning, um, planning hierarchy where communication actions are just symbols for now. But the idea is that in practice, you would like these communication symbols to reflect and describe what's happening in, in practice in that specific environment. So for example, if you are far, far away from the human, you may not want to, uh, to issue a verbal uh, command, or not command, verbal communication. Uh, <laughs> the robots not command humans. <laughs> a verbal communication uh, action. Whereas, for example, if you know that the human is not watching you if, if they are turned uh, they have turned their backs to you then maybe a, a visual communication action is not appropriate maybe you need to issue uh, a sound type of communication so this is included in the model and for the planning uh, framework we don't care what this model is it really depends on the uh, application that you're considering okay so this human sensor model is used to update the belief of what the human might do if they hear that or, or if, if they receive that communication symbol from us. And of course, we have a cost function to guide that search. In this particular case, cost function for us is a very, very complicated uh, function. We spend quite some time trying to think about that. It, the details are in the paper, but includes components like how close you came to the human. Uh, it's not always appropriate to say that a plan that brought us near the human is the, the worst case, but this is one of the components. The other is how fast you go to the goal, all kinds of things. Okay, so let me show you how this now works. The, uh, the robot creates first a motion planning uh, uh, tree using these control barrier functions where it accounts for the movement of the human, which is predicted through the motion model. And there is a, a goal for the robot, and the robot decides that based on its own priorities for its mission, that it should be here. But let's say that the human motion model says the human is also going to be there. So now the robot needs to issue a communication action to the human and say, oh, you know, I'm moving forward, hoping that the human is going to listen to that and uh, change their, their actions. But of course, because we do use the uh, safety uh, control barrier functions, uh, even if the human doesn't uh, listen to our uh, communication action, then we can still be safe, of course, uh, assuming some risk. 
So then hopefully the human will uh, listen to the robot or uh, help the robot and the robot will go to its uh, local goal, making progress towards the global goal. Okay, so we ran some uh, experiments. We have some costs and we compared RRT planning in three different scenarios in a completely open space where you, are sure, you, you kind of guess that there are plenty of ways to solve this uh, motion planning problem without the human and the robot interacting at all in uh, narrow uh, hallways and intersections. And here you see the results, basic intersection hallway, and we have the new communication aware approach and just RRTs. And you can see that in the hallway, sometimes we couldn't solve the problem. The robot and the human might get stuck and therefore you get infinite uh, uh, cost for, for, for the interaction. Uh, in, you can see here that the basic scenario, it seems that communication aware planning might do a little bit worse than no communication because you have plenty of space to move around. But when you have intersection and hallway where you have to actually interact to, to resolve the uh, planning problem, then communication uh, seems to behave better. Of course, under the assumption that the human in these simulate experiments listens to the robot. That's the, the working assumption. If they don't listen, that's a different question. Yeah. It's very sensitive to the horizon that you use for planning. Like yes, yes. All these uh, matter a lot, indeed. Uh, the problem is that now you have to solve many hierarchical problems and you cannot have too long horizon. That's the challenge. Uh, really a computational intensive process. That's a good one. Sure. Uh, so as far as I saw, uh, the goal of the human is later than the goal of the robot in the intersection scenario. Uh, later? Um, I mean, if uh, the human gives weight. So the purple one is the robot and the blue one is the human. They, they have to exchange positions. Uh, which one? The, the 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 robot has to go here and the human has to go here for the intersection scenario if the human gives way to the robot he or she cannot reach its goal uh the correct policy should be the robot should give uh, away to the human right uh, all right, this is a detail I'm not entirely sure about. <laughs> I suspect the, <laughs> the students working on this experiment must have an answer to that, but this is a good point. I need to, to ask about that. The, the, um, what I would like to highlight here is the following. Um, we also have a priority factor that you can tune, like the, pri the robot has lower priority or the robot has higher priority. If the robot has lower priority, then that issue that uh, we you know raised is resolved because the robot always lets the human do whatever they like if the robot has higher priority what they do is they are more aggressive and they also try to communicate more and you can see that in uh, maybe you cannot really see there it's unfortunately this is not a good color um in the hallway experiment if the robot has higher priority, then the cost increases. So the lower cost is where the, the robot has lower priority. Uh, whereas in this intersection example, there is a peak between low and high priority. And this region where the robot has uh, higher priority seems to give us better results overall. So th there is unfortunately no uh, formal um, proof here on what is better. It's more kind of uh what is going to be better in practice and we are going to or we are in the process of doing experiments with humans to see how these simulations translate in practice but this, uh, irrespective of that i think we need to start thinking in terms of planning the communication between the humans and the robots and this has nothing to do with social awareness because this is an additional component you need to consider there's a lot of literature in human-robot interaction where you're actively planning for the robot to behave in socially acceptable ways for the humans. This is completely orthogonal to that in the sense that we need to start thinking about planning human-robot communication. All right, neural network stuff. I guess I don't have time. It's already uh, time, but um, I would like to 
to highlight that we have work that deals with disturbances where now they are not stochastic but uh, kind of within bounds they're bounded and the 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 issue there was that we're running into a we had to solve an optimization problem within an optimization problem and then the control barrier functions were becoming too time consuming so what we did is we used neural networks to learn the uh, control barrier functions so you're doing a lot of offline computations you're training the neural network using the dagger uh, algorithm and then it seemed to work very well in practice on top you see uh, the offline uh, data generation process and the bottom is the uh, the trajectories after we have trained the neural network and here you have a lot of noise wind gusts things like that control barrier function here or are you learning a policy we're learning the control barrier function and uh yes we learned the, uh let me go back so we have here uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the control input because uh, it doesn't make sense to only learn the because it's time consuming yeah finally uh another project we just presented in iros 2022 um and with that i will stop the idea here is again we'd like to use control barrier functions but now we take lidar measurements and we would like to the robot to learn the control barrier function from the lidar measurements so here we collect the data from the distance measurements to the obstacles we use this to train a deep neural network to to build upon a basic um control barrier function that we assume here so the function h will have this form and we we use this as a starting point because the robot should learn potentially the dynamics of the obstacles if they are moving also any sense or noise that you have things like that and this can be done online the beauty of this is that we can do all this symbolically so we can you can compute all the gradients that you need symbolically and include them inside a model predictive controller uh, program and you can add here your uh, collision avoidance constraints as symbolic equations that come from the neural network so quite cool idea i didn't come with that idea the, the student working on the project came up with ideas so it was very cool and here are some simulation results and i think i'll close with that because i'm already way over time so this is the robot moving around in simulation uh, you see the LiDAR here, the measurements taken. More and more complicated environments. Moving obstacles. And of course, uh, physical robot, but speed up. The robot's getting stuck sometimes. There's a lot of uh, learning and other stuff happening, but uh, overall, this looks very uh, exciting uh, what i'm most excited about this is that we have a symbolic encoding of the neural network of the control barrier function inside the model predictive controller so that's the cool idea all right um what i uh some points to remember here i think it is important to define the risk because a lot of the controls actions that we do in driving cars robots around have to 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 consider risk so i think it's necessary here uh, stochastic control barrier functions appear to, be, appear to be a good path toward utilizing different risk notions so for example i noticed that recently uh ames group are using value at risk as a risk uh as a risk measure if you will so there's a lot of research going on along this direction so very exciting stuff uh, neural networks may be necessary to deploy cpf based controllers in systems where we have computational constraints or where the cpf may be hard to analytically model so we may have to learn something there and there's a lot of work along these lines and finally human robot uh, communication i think it's going to be very important for the next generation of service robots uh, I cannot imagine how you could deploy service robots without being able to plan for the communication. And a lot of sponsors over the years, uh, students have worked on all these things. Thank you for listening to me. Um, appreciate it.
opportunity. And all this work, the risks on the obstacles, is it possible to put the risk on the goal? On the goal, um, in, in the sense that the goal might be uh, a stock. Uh, what do you mean? But I want to have a low, low. I want to be sure that I will not eat all the cars, but want to low chance to not arrive at my oh, I see. Uh, target point. All right, that's a good point. Uh, Mitchell is uh, might be working on these things, uh, right? Or uh... you question. Uh, so uh, having like strict constraints over the obstacles, but uh, the risk is put in uh, the, the objective, like just going to the target set with a high probability or... <clears throat> yeah, I think that the, you know, they're thematically similar. You can define some kind of other function, controlling the opera function, something like that, and analyze it with the same type of approach. Yeah, it, it is possible, yeah. There was very very popular. I'm confused about one one point. Why is it? Why is the assumption that uh, the human will sense the communication from the robot and change their action? Why is this a problem? Oh, this is not the uh, um, this. Uh, we don't make that assumption. Uh, in principle, the human can react any way they like, and this is more like a suggestion. Uh, and we just demonstrated that if it happens that in simulation, if the, the human listens actually to the robot uh, instruction or uh, suggestion, that's a better word, suggestion, then your overall planning improves like the goals, which is not surprising. That's why we do robot to robot communication in order to achieve uh, faster our goals, right? So this is not surprising at all. We are just saying that we need to incorporate it into our uh, algorithmic process. And the other point I was making is that actually it's not cheap. Unfortunately, it's not cheap because you have to solve many problems. You have to solve the, the robot motion planning problem. Then you have to solve the communication actions that you are going to compute. And if the human decides to ignore you completely because they're absent minded or whatever, then this ruins all your computational effort. But I don't see any other way if you have to interact in closed environments, right? The, the human might give instructions to the robot, say, okay, your robot go away, I, I have priority, but um, that doesn't necessarily optimize the, the overall problem. So we need to take that into account. Sure. Any questions? One more. I have a question about the optimization in the first part of talk. So uh, we are not only choosing the control action, you are also choosing the safety condition, the coefficient in safety condition. And yes, the, yes. And I was curious about why that should also be in the optimization process. Uh, because you may want to compute better bounds or you may do want to relax them uh, as long as you don't violate the strict upper bound. You may want to 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 be as safe as possible that the upper bound allows, or you may even want to go be beyond that. Let's say uh, this type of problems, what I didn't mention, and it's known for among the people who work on this class of uh, control barrier functions is that in some cases your constraints are so strict that you get infeasibility. And then the question is, what do you do? Maybe uh, computing a control action that is even more uh, risky than your upper bound is better than not computing anything at all. So maybe you want to have that as a kind of a soft constraint. So you may want to optimize over all these things as you solve the problem. Thank you. That's a very insightful point. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, that's, that's exciting. It, uh, yeah, that's the best part of it. <laughs> I mean, I slowed you down, but uh, it, uh, people, were, people were paying attention. So um, I had to be careful about your name because my. Uh,
to uh, I'm surprised you 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 know Metsovio. It would be uh, Greek name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anna Stefanopoulos. She teaches in the camp. Oh, I see. She's actually in a different meeting right now. So she can't come to your talk. The writing is really good in Greek. <laughs> Yorgos, Greek uh, person is Siganis. Yeah. 12-dimensional card or more. Usually, that'd be... Much more numerically unstable. I saw that you have a paper recently. My disturbance estimation.